Well, hello, everyone. I want to welcome you again to another one of our live streams as we continue our new series on the church and politics. If you're familiar, if you're new to Determined Truth, you can go to DeterminedTruth.com on our website. We have a tab for the YouTube channel, a tab for the podcast, and a tab for the blogs and different things like that as well. I want to encourage you to, to check that out. Also, go to the YouTube channel and subscribe. Like the videos and subscribe, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this delayed uh, you know, later on on YouTube. Uh, that really helps the, the uh, algorithms and gets us noticed and gets more views uh, there also. So what we're going to do in these next two episodes is look at the issue of the church and Christian nationalism. What is Christian nationalism? What does it mean? How is it affecting or impacting the church? And, and how should we look at this uh, from, from a Christian, eye, uh, Christian lens? So I'm, I'm glad to have today uh, with me my co-host and uh, colleague Danny uh, Hall. So Danny, welcome. Good to be here again. Uh, and uh, today we've got a very special guest. And our special guest, some of you have seen him on our podcast, or you've heard him on our podcast before. You've also seen him on live streams as well. Uh, so da uh, Dr. David Crump. So David is a retired professor of New Testament at Calvin College, a former pastor with more than 30 years of combined experience in the pulpit and in the classroom. Uh, he's written a number of books, including Encountering Jesus and Encountering Scripture, Reading the Bible Critically in Faith, uh, another book called Knocking on Heaven's Door, a New Testament Theology of Petitionary Prayer. I think David did his uh, doctoral work on prayer uh, in the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And he's also written uh, Like Birds in a Cage, Christian Zionism's Collaboration and the Oppression of the Palestinians. We had David on for one of our live streams on the Israel-Gaza uh, uh, theme. So if you go to the YouTube channel and uh, uh, on the playlist Israel-Gaza, you'll see the live stream that we did with David. But here today, we're actually here to talk about his other book, David, uh, I Pledge Allegiance, A Believer's Guide to Kingdom Citizenship in 21st Century America. So, uh, David, we want to welcome you today. Well, thank you for having me, Rob. It's good to be here. All right. Excellent. So, David, let's just start. Maybe how about if you give us what you think your definition of Christian nationalism, uh, of nationalism itself, and then maybe Christian nationalism in particular. So I'll begin by talking about nationalism and then Christian nationalism. And um, to do that, let me begin with another term, the idea of patriotism. Uh, patriotism, I would say, is a perfectly legitimate position for a Christian to adopt, which simply means that they appreciate their home. They appreciate where they live, where they've been born, uh, the culture that they're a part of, the land that they have grown up in, and they have a certain uh, affinity for it, even a devotion perhaps, to wanting to see the best unfold and develop for the people that they call uh, their people. And that's a perfectly okay thing for a Christian to enjoy, I believe. Nationalism comes into the picture when you identify a very specific people group and add that to your patriotism and then ramp it up with a devotion to what we will call the nation. And there are a variety of different ways one can define the nation. You identify it by sharing in a common history, a shared language, a shared culture, a common religion, a certain ethnicity, all of these things in different configurations can go into the formation of a national identity. And when identity, however it's defined with those factors, then we enter into the realm of nationalism. And my argument would be that even to go this far, even to be a nationalist is a mistake, particularly for the Christian. Nationalism is always tribalism. It's always a form of being tribalistic and identifying oneself as us and other people as them. And you end up with this us and them view of the world, which is not helpful for anybody and can usually become quite antagonistic. Christianism takes that religious component, amplifies more specificity. Re Nationalism itself is always a religious ideology, I believe. Way back in 1960, a history professor at Columbia University named Carlton Hayes wrote a book, 
with the title Nationalism, colon, a religion. And he was already laying this out in great detail way back then, and he wasn't the first to do it. You have a higher power, which is the nation. You have saints, like founding fathers. You have holy days, like Memorial Day and the 4th of July. <clears throat> and you generally have a very specific understanding of God's nation. You are a special people with a special plan in God's mind's eye. Christian nationalism picks up on that and specifies this religiosity in terms of Christianity. The nation must be a Christian nation. Um, you have a particular plan in the Christian God's role for history, and you want the Christian church to be particularly comfortable, if not even empowered in some way or another, to have power and authority in the way that the society and the culture organizes itself. None of that has anything to do with the gospel or the kingdom of God, which right, is its right. principal downfall. Uh, maybe I should stop that. Okay. Um, excellent, David. And um, you can expand upon this if you want, but th there's a, almost a sense where Christian nationalism is a misnomer, right? Because it's, it's really not Christian. Um, so go ahead and feel free to expand on that. But let me let me ask you also, Dave, I'm going to skip uh, the next question here um, and kind of go down just to have, you know, and, and if you're watching us live, there's a little bit of a delay and, and we'll, we'll work with that. And for Danny and David's sake, uh, I can edit that out of the final that will actually go on the, uh, the the permanent YouTube channel. So we'll just kind of uh, just kind of pause what, when it happens. So we apologize if you're watching us live. And if you are watching us live, we do encourage you to go ahead and put comments in the comment box. And if we have any time for questions, we'll do our best to get to those questions. But let me also ask, David, uh, you have a chapter in your book on American exceptionalism. Can, can you kind of define for us what American exceptionalism is and how that fits into this conversation of Christian nationalism? Sure, sure. That's an important item. Uh, American exceptionalism is the idea that the United States is a particularly chosen nation with a special agenda in God's plan for the world. Sometimes they even go so far as talking about God having established a covenant with the United States, that we are covenant people. And this is an idea such that whatever the United States does, say in its foreign policy, what it's doing around the world, it is sent by God to spread democracy, freedom, the American way of life and Christianity throughout the world through its foreign policy and also to implement that in its domestic policy. Yeah, yeah. Um, this has it to become very, very expansionistic. It has a great deal of privilege attached to it. It's also related to something sometimes referred to as manifest destiny, where the United States and its government believe that it had, had the right to expand west across the continent to eradicate the Native Americans because they were the pagans standing in the way of God's nation. And eventually it expanded to include hemisphere. And we believe that uh, Central and South America are all ours to do with as we choose. Um, and inevitably that ends up in a lot of exploitation and uh, suffering for people that we decide we have the right to determine their destinies for them. Of course, once again, none of this has anything to do with the gospel or the kingdom of God. Uh, so it all needs to be rejected outright. <clears throat> um, David, it seems to me there's, a, there's still a lot of people in our churches that, that hold on to this idea uh, of exceptionalism. Um, sometimes they'll say that, they're, that national virtues and Christian virtues overlap enough so that when we are exporting these things, we're actually doing good. So what do we say to Christians that sort of embrace this idea of the American conceptualism and how it impacts the way we view the, uh, ourselves and the world? Sure, sure. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that America has never done good throughout the rest of the world. I mean, there are instances where we have been a benefit to other peoples that we've engaged with. Uh, and as you say, there are certain points where Christian virtues and 
the virtues of American involvement as elsewhere have overlapped with one another. We major on that point um, at the neglect of a realistic understanding of human nature and human sin. All societies are fallen societies. All governments are fallen governments. All nations are fallen nations governed by fallen people. And so think, for instance, of the importance that our politicians make on pursuing policies that are in Americans' best interest, right. America's best interest. That's really the guiding principle for our entanglements elsewhere. What's to our benefit most of all? And we might cover that up with humanitarian sounding language, but uh, at the end of the day, um, our foreign policy ends up being quite exploit exploitative in seeing how we can get the resources, say for example, out of other countries. Uh, mm -hmm. how we can mine the minerals in other countries for our own mm -hmm. benefit. It's, we've seen this all throughout our engagement with Central and South America in those countries. We talk about yeah. wanting to bring them democracy, and then what do we do? We establish dictatorial governments that protect American multinational corporations that are exploiting their resources. Yeah. So Christians need to open their eyes. And devotion to nation that Christian nationalism can wrap around our eyes and we need this kind of behavior. Hmm. Let me ask a quick uh, follow up, Ken Robert. Please. Yeah. The arguments I hear from people, if we don't words, if we don't go into these places and do that, then the then the Russians or the Chinese will. So it's like somebody's going to do this and we're better than they we're better than we would do it better than those <laughs> other countries were. And plus the whole international balance of power, that kind of thing sort of gets to this contest of how to manage these resources. Do you know you can say in this? Because that's sometimes the argument I hear back about this, you know, that we are more virtuous than say the Chinese or the Russians, and they're going to come in and make mm -hmm. do the colonial and uh, exploitation things. We've got to come in and balance and, and do something to stop that. You're right. That is a common argument. <clears throat> And I'd, I'd have a multi-part answer to that. I, I'd first, first of all remind my friend talking to me that it has to do with the church and the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And we can't confuse yeah. the church and society. Right. So let's be realistic about my personal responsibility in this and what the effects of American foreign policy are going to be. The second thing I would mention is that it's easier to remain to to maintain that kind of position if you're ignorant of the details of our the history of let's stick with foreign policy again. So for instance, I recently saw an interview with some African leaders being asked about the great investment that China is making in the African continent right now, which as mm -hmm. you say is very upsetting to American policymakers. Uh, we're not happy at all with what China is doing in many African nations. And this one ruler was asked to compare uh, which was more beneficial to his country, American involvement or Chinese involvement? And why were they allowing such Chinese investment into their infrastructure? And his answer, I thought, was very, very illuminating. He says, when I asked for help from the United States, I get somebody telling me what I have to be doing, and they send me military equipment. Mm. When I ask for help from China, they build me a hospital, I think. Wow. In the kind of record that we have established for ourselves around the world. The United States has a tendency, again, to see the military as the solution to most issues and um, to be rather bullying in the way that we treat other nations. Whether we like China or not, it's building hospitals where we were sending um, Scud missiles. Hmm. Now, I happen to believe in the sovereignty of God. As a Christian, I believe that my primary responsibility is being invested in the kingdom of God. Yeah. And so I leave it to God's sovereignty as to uh, how these things work themselves out on the international scene. I don't think 
that the United States needs to be the final arbiter in how these things unfold. And let me take the conversation a little back. That's, uh, thank you, David, for, for that. Now, too, uh, so we had a series of podcasts, you might recall, David, in November of 2021, uh, in December 2021, on Christian nationalism, and we brought you on to discuss your book then um, as well. So if you want to go to the podcast at DeterminedTruth.com, and you can get the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, anywhere you get your podcast there. Uh, and one of the things I noted, David, was that in, in that series was, I really think this is an issue of about power. And so let's talk about Christian nationalism kind of in the gospel and whether or not you agree that that really the, the issue of between the gospel and the kingdom of God uh, and nationalism and Christian nationalism and these, uh, is this a, a, a dialogue about what power looks like? And then is there, if that's, if you agree with that, is there a fundamental difference then, as I would affirm, in the Christian way of doing power, which is surrendering and dying for the sake of the other, versus the way the nations do power. I don't know what, you, what your thoughts are on that. I would agree with that, Rob, uh, completely. Okay. One of the things that following Jesus means we're, is that we're made citizens of the kingdom of God, and we're to be living out this citizenship at all times in every aspect political involvement that we may decide to take on. And as you say, the ethics of the kingdom of God highlight servanthood, prioritizing the needs of the other, right. loving my enemy, and seeing what I can do for their own better. The ethics of Christian nationalism wants to put Christianity in the driver's seat of the nation. And in order to do that, you need to be able to exercise power, secular power, worldly power. Um, one of the ways we see this in the church today is this movement that talks about dominating the seven mountains of influence. Maybe you've heard of this before. There are these seven areas of society, like the economy, the arts, mm. literature, politics uh, i forget all seven of them but there are seven and sports they teach pizza. that christians need to <laughs> yes right right uh christians are supposed to become involved in the leadership of all of these areas and control right. the way they operate and the way they function so that christians then are controlling the development of the culture and our society for the the glory of God. But as soon as you start talking about using worldly means to exercise worldly authority, right. uh, you've parted company from life in the kingdom of God. Because right. as you say, you know, Jesus makes it clear in the kingdom, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. Right. In society, people exercise power by dominating others. But within the kingdom of God, you show yourself to be a disciple by serving others. So the ways of this world and the ways of the kingdom are really diametrically opposed to one another in that way. And power is at the focal point of that. Right. Now, let me follow up with that, David. Um, I would like to make a distinction between Christians who, who, who follow Christian nationalism and Christian nationalism as an ideology. I don't think those two necessarily go together. I don't think that all Christian nationalists are Christians. I think there are people who are Christian nationalists, Christian nationalists who are secular and not religious. They just if they they just think that this country's for us and us is defined as Christian, whatever that may be. W would you agree with that assessment? I would agree completely. Okay. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, even the phrase Christian nationalism right. is is uh, an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a Christian nation. There can be Christian people, and there is a Christian church. But there's no such thing as a Christian nation, not strictly speaking. Right, so the right. term there is being used as a cover for what we would think of as kind of a, a religious veneer over society. And it's so loose and so wide open that you may have heard recently, even the renowned atheist Richard Dawkins recently gave an interview where he described himself as a cultural Christian. Oh, wow. 
he, he doesn't believe in God. Yeah. He doesn't believe anything that. about the Bible says or the gospel. But he said he embraces cultural Christianity mainly as wow. a bulwark against the spread of uh, Islam. Shows you how loosey goosey oh. the the meaning of the term can be. Yeah, because he yeah he's an ardent uh, atheist. Go ahead, Danny. I was, was coming back to this theme of the kingdom of God. Um, one of the things I did like about your book, and as you get to the end of it, you get the last chapter, you know, on uh, being being a kingdom church. This whole idea of being uh, part of the kingdom. You even mentioned in one place that a colleague, uh, what, you, what you call one of your nicest compliments was when he said that in exasperation, he could never predict where you would come down on a controversial topic. And your answer was that, you know, I hope it's because I'm trying to think biblically and not politically. So this whole idea of the kingdom of God being central and the way we live out, even our politics, could you unpack that for us a little bit? Sure. Every Christian's partisanship, if we want to use that word, needs to align with Jesus and be determined by one's citizenship in the kingdom of God. So what that means is that I don't look to political parties or movement to be the benchmark or the direction finder for how I view issues in society, issues in my life, social issues, political issues, etc. I need to be thinking the way Jesus teaches me to think. Yeah. I go back to um, the Great Commission in Matthew 28. We're going into the world to make disciples of all nations. We do that by baptizing them and then by teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us. That's how you make a disciple. That's what I want to be. So I need to be obeying the teaching of Jesus. And here's what I think the church fails consistently. I know preachers love, love Paul. I love Pauline theology. It's essential. But it's not where we need to be beginning, and that doesn't need to be our foundation. The teaching of Jesus needs to be our beginning, and that needs to be our foundation. So I would think every church in America would do right if they started uh, discipleship classes that led everybody through the Sermon on the Mount. And we learn there that we are to live by blessing our enemies, by praying for those who hate us, by serving those who malign us, by seeking first the kingdom of God and mm -hmm. making our identification with Christ, the crucified, resurrected Christ as the end all and the be all of our identity. If we focus on that, we're going to find that we look at things going on in this world in totally different ways than we ever did yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's never going to be Go Republican ahead. or Democrat or have you one quick follow-up on this practically yeah. speaking if let's say rob and i are in yeah. a discussion about a particular topic and are both motivated to live out kingdom uh values but we have different landing places for what on a particular issue okay and i think well-meaning christians do differ on the application of kingdom values in certain political questions. Do you have any advice or insight or thought about how, how we as Christians we disagree, even if we're coming from the right motivations, we might have a different outcome in what we think we should be doing? Yeah, good question. Good, good question. Well, I say this is a good conversation to have when it's happening within Christian community, as you say, your brothers mm -hmm. in Christ, uh, and you have your Bibles open together. Uh, you're, you're both somewhat conversant with the history of theology and the theological issues at stake when it comes to this question. And you're talking about this then in terms of what scripture and theology have to say about it. I'd say you first of all want to lay out what you think your operating principles are. What are the most fundamental issues at stake here? Uh, and then once you have that sorted out and you see how both scripture and theology are leading you to that primary principle, you then talk about its implementation. 
And what what is the most successful way to implement that principle within this policy decision, whatever it may happen to be? And you're right. I think that Christians are those things. But within the church, we always need to be reminding ourselves that the focal point of our community is Jesus, right? Not politics. Exactly. So we yeah, there yeah. may be points where we just have to agree to disagree. Maybe that disagreement is a very strong disagreement. But political agreement is not the basis of our unity or our fellowship. Jesus is. Right. And we hopefully can look at each other and realize we both have integrity. Mm -hmm. We both have used scripture wisely. We both have a theological understanding yeah. that is coherent, and we have to respect each other. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that, that, excellent, David. I, I think Danny might have used a better illustration because he said, "If if me and Danny have a disagreement, I think the answer is I'm I'm right on that one. But yeah. but if Danny and somebody else have a disagreement, then then we apply uh, what you had to say there, David. But uh, no, thank. So so let me actually step off uh, and kind of add to that a little bit more, David, and see what you think about this here. And that is, you know, here Danny and I are trying to do a series on the church and politics, and a series of live streams on different topics and things like that. Would you say that we would really be better serving the church to do a series on the church, calling it the, the church in politics, but really saying we're going to study Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in the Sermon on the Mount for a couple of months. That that would better serve us than talking about isolated issues and, and how, we, how we navigate through that? Can you repeat that question, Rob? I missed okay, most yeah, of it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, so would you say if Danny and I are putting a series together on the church and politics, that we would be better served, or our our audience would be better served by spending two months on the Sermon on the Mount than talking about isolated issues? Oh, ab absolutely. I'd say absolutely that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things I find particularly frustrating uh, as I talk with people about this, look, I live in I live in West Northwest Montana. I'm I'm deep yeah. in the heart of Trump country. Uh, I'm I haven't taken an official poll in my congregation. I go to a very large church, but I'm sure the vast majority of people uh, are Trump supporters and would think that I'm some kind of a wacko, a crazy person in this church. But I st stay there. I stay there in order to be uh, representing the way I see things ought to be. And what I discover consistently in my conversations with people is that they don't really know Scripture and they mm -hmm. don't know theology and the political environment in which they find themselves. You know, study after study has discovered that Christians generally vote just like their neighbors, no matter what the issues are. We yeah. are in a current in a stream of influence, and that's what determines our political ideologies. So <clears throat> to study the Sermon on the Mount and to deeply embed people in Scripture and then to be giving them the exposition and the understanding that would open up a new theological horizon for them yeah. would have many, many applications to all kinds of issues in life, more than, than you could ever a study class. So that's absolutely the right way to go. Okay, so let me add to that a little bit more then, David, because I think one of the things that we do... You know, I once, I once is, was teaching... Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add, it's a story in the book. I once was teaching an adult education class at Calvin University. And I was going through the theme of, of wealth about wealth and poverty uh, than any of the other Gospels, or actually any other book in the New Testament besides perhaps the Epistle of James. So I was just walking through this material and um, helping people understand. I don't know if you're recording me when we go out. I was assailed by an elderly woman <laughs> who rebuked me by saying, I thought I was 
coming to a Bible study, not a class on politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was incapable of noticing scripture yeah. and only saw it as politics. Yeah, interesting. All right. So let me add to that and then, David. That is and we are, we are, I okay. find. No, sorry. Uh, let me let me add to that, David. And we are getting you on the recording, and and we'll we'll th those of you watching live, we thank you very much. As we have a little bit of a technical uh, issues, we'll try to clean it up for the final edition that, that kind of goes in the web there. Um, hopefully, I can do that. I'm not sure if I can or not. We'll see. We'll see. But one of the things I think that happens is this is just natural. Is that if I start reading Jesus, Matthew five, six, and seven, and the Sermon on the Mount. What I'm what I'm automatically doing is is trying to filter that through my lens of uh oh that that sounds too democratic or that sounds too republican or, you know that sounds too much in in support of this political issue or that political issue and I'm and so but I think what what tell me what you think of this what we would really like to do is say let's just step away from that and let's just see what Jesus says and realize it's he's not going to fit in any political bubble to begin with let's let's just take Jesus at Jesus's terms. And then let's figure out how we apply this to our political thing there. But instead of trying to filter Jesus through our political lens, what, what do you think about that? Oh, I think you're exactly right. I think you're exactly right. We have, we have all of these bells and whistles in the back of our mind, again, from our social and cultural conditioning of views that we find acceptable and unacceptable. And generally, we've done that throughout our lifetimes without ever touching base with what God has to say in his word or what Jesus teaches us in the Gospels. And so we are much more sensitive to those cultural paradigms than we are to biblical teaching and understanding. And this is the challenge of discipleship. I mean, we all face this in a myriad of different ways. When we surrender ourselves to God, we agree tacitly or otherwise that I want to begin to think the way Jesus thinks. I want to begin to behave the way Jesus tells me to behave. And I recognize that that is going to challenge me and make me very uncomfortable in all kinds of ways that I can't even foresee. And the measure of my discipleship is going to be how I submit myself to that instruction and then go out and live this uncomfortable, challenging lifestyle that Jesus offers to me. Wow, that's important. Yeah, one of the things I picked up also very important in the, in the, in the latter part of the book on the chapter about the church is you, you also did a really good job of critiquing the notion that uh, of sort of the liberal agenda of simply social involving in social issues and causing apart from the teaching of the gospel. So right. you, you take both ends of the spectrum. Sometimes when people hear us discuss this, they think, oh, these are people who are just sort of like advocating a liberal to political point of view. You have a very good critique of that as well and trying to balance all that. Could you speak to that a little bit? Because I think that helped people clarify this kingdom mentality versus political persuasion the partisanship. Sure, sure. Um, I was at um, a lecture once given by a very prominent Christian social activist. I won't mention any names, uh, but his book coming out pretty soon. And um, the lecture that he gave could have been taken right out of the Democratic playbook. And in fact, one of my colleagues stood up to ask a question. And, and asked him this directly. He said, you know, everything that you've told us could have been said by any Democratic politician. Uh, it's really no different. Can you help us see what is uniquely Christian about the way you approach these matters? And he really struggled to answer that question. He never really did answer it very effectively mm -hmm. for whatever reason, which quite surprised me because he's been at this for a long, long time. I mean, what you raise is a serious concern, um, and it's something about self-examination that I need to be involved with in and of myself all of the time 
as we have the conversations with brothers and sisters who are different from us, such as you were describing, um, we were talking about earlier when we have our disagreements. Now, I think the fact of the matter is a great deal of the teaching of the Bible and the teaching of Jesus is going to sound liberal to Americans. Mm. Um, and so that's going to be inevitable. We're going to be just accused of being uh, milk toast liberals on, on regular occasions. And what we're compelled to do then is to actually point to Scripture and Jesus and show that, no, this is not a political commitment I've made, commitment I've made as a right. part of my Christian discipleship. And conversely, when conservative friends come up to us and say, but what about this, David? Here's my conservative view. Doesn't God have some kind of endorsement for this? I need to honestly examine Scripture and think theologically and recognize that there may be a case there and, and say, yeah, you're right. You're right about that. Um, I need to adopt integrated view as well. Well, in light of that, can you just talk about a little bit of the relationship between uh, the gospel and politics as you see it? So how do we bring that? I mean, I think you kind of uh, hinted at that with the, we got to you know, get into scripture, thinking Christianly. What's the, in your mind, how would you define the relationship between the gospel and politics? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> I would want to begin by reminding people that if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, again, first mm. and foremost. And that makes you a member of the church, the body of Christ, first and foremost. Right. And the church is not the world, and the world is not the church. And I don't say that in order to exclude Christian involvement in politics, obviously. Yeah. Of course not. I would never say that at all. Sometimes yeah. my position, I'm, I'm accused of being an Anabaptist, that I'm, I'm saying we shouldn't be involved in politics or should shun the world like people living in communes, and I would never endorse that. However, we need to remember that my political involvement is secondary, and it must always come under the umbrella of my discipleship to Jesus Christ. So I must do politics as a Christian disciple. In name only, but in actual character and consistent activity. And honestly, the way that American politics works today, I, I personally am very skeptical as to whether an authentic disciple of Jesus could ever be very successful in American politics. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Imagine a politician who always tells the truth, <laughs> never lies, <clears throat> never does anything underhanded or corrupt, never, never launches an attack ad, you know, never does any of the things that are so common. Maybe that person could be successful in a unique environment. I don't know, but yeah. I think the chances are slim. But whether it means your re-election or your defeat, right. that's the way you need to behave. Right. That's the way right. you should do it. There's such a pragmatic. Right. If you're able to do it successfully, then I would say that a, a Christian. Yeah, there's there's so much of a, the end justifies the mean the one people that name yeah. Christ and in politics. Yes, I've got to get elected in order to be able uh, to make a change. Lord willing. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And they compromise to have access, yep. to have power. Yep. And that's where we show that we really don't believe in the sovereignty of God. We really don't yeah. believe that God is in control of the world. And we really don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. The policies that I need to be pursuing ought to be ones that, again, are consistent with the ethics of the kingdom of God. How do I pursue policies that help the downtrodden? How do I pursue policies that help us to love our neighbor, to love our enemies, to be a blessing to other people? Uh, those would be the kind of policy issues you need to put up front. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Now. Let me stop by. <laughs> let me stop by now and give a, a, a remind. We're running a little bit low on time. We're going to play rapid fire with David in a few minutes here. Maybe one or two more questions. I see a couple comments in the comments box. Thank you. And um, 
Determined Truth is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. Uh, Danny and I work every single week with about 100 pastors in India, working to train these pastors and give them an understanding of the gospel and the kingdom and what it means for them and for their churches. We have a YouTube channel, of course, as you might know. We have a podcast. We have a blog. We have other things that we're doing to help be a voice to the American church to say, hey, what does it mean and what does it look like to look to follow Jesus and to follow the Lamb in this massively politicized climate that our church has found ourselves in. So we're trying to be a voice of the American church as well, um, but we can't do all that without your support. So we'd encourage you to go to determinedtruth.com and give. If you've been blessed by our live streams or by our podcasts or by our blogs or anything else that we're doing, if you'll support us $5 a month, $10 a month, $5 million a month, well, you know, anywhere in between would be fine. Uh, uh, we, we would appreciate that. So, uh, I don't know if you have another question or not, Danny, but let, let me kind of go. One of the comments that they, I think, David, that people make often is they go to Romans chapter 13 and, and they use Romans 13 as kind of this crutch to say or this bully stick to say. Um, uh, we have to submit to our government and therefore whatever it does is right. God's put it in power to do you good. And this full support, you know, I had Michael Gorman, of course, on our podcast, because Michael's an ex expert. He written a, his book on the book, uh, uh, commentary on the book of Romans. And he's like, I'm not sure that's what Romans 13 is actually about. I don't know what your thoughts in terms of Romans 13 and how it fits into this particular conversation there. And then I think we got one or two comments in the in the comment box. And then we'll go to rapid fire unless Danny has something else. No, I'm good. Okay. 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 Well, I, I do. You have a significant section in my book where I discuss Romans 13 okay. and interpret it and then apply it to this question. So I would encourage people, if I can be uh, guilty of shameless self-promotion here for a moment, go buy my book and read it. Pay attention to pages. I think it's 56 to 59 or so. That understanding of Romans 13 that you've just outlined is really a misunderstanding of what the text says. And unfortunately, some English translations do get it wrong, where some translations say that, you know, God has established uh, all positions of authority and we are commanded to obey those in authority over us. Actually, the word obey never occurs in the passage anywhere. Right. What the passage emphasizes is so that apparently whatever it is is in the human psyche that leads us to gather together into groups and then to create an ordering system of responsibility and leadership is given to us by God to manage ourselves in groups for that God has commanded that this ordering process take place. He never says that God puts every mm -hmm. leader into a position of authority. We can't draw that conclusion. That okay. was the logic that was applied in Nazi Germany by the German Christian mm -hmm. Church. You know, God put Hitler in has ordered our society and we need to cooperate with that order so that we see that there are positions and roles of responsibility and leadership and that position of leadership. However, Paul also says in Romans 13 that we are to live our lives in obedience to God and follow a godly conscience, that we are to make decisions on the basis of a clear godly conscience. So when my Christian conscience comes into conflict with a law or a rule or a directive from a properly ordered authority, I need to obey my conscience and I need mm. to disobey the established authority. I continue to submit to the ordering process and to the authority God has placed in society by taking whatever punishment is going to be meted out to me when I disobey. And I'm willing to take that punishment as a Christian disciple when I decide it violates my conscience to obey a rule or a law. So mm -hmm. that would be my answer yeah. to that. Uh, excellent. All right, we have uh, one of the comments in the comment box there, and, and uh, I want to address it. We have three pastors on the screen, so uh, keep your answers concise. Uh, but Danny, you can answer as well, and, and David, you can answer also. So uh, the question was, or the comment was, 
I'm really wondering if I can be involved in politics as a Christian. Uh, how would you help this person process that question or, or that, uh, that issue? I wonder if I can be involved in politics as a Christian. This is the question someone's asked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, statement to that effect, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think the intention is because... Well, as I said before, yeah, certainly you can be involved in politics as a Christian. Okay. You just need to be sure that you're a Christian um, first before you're... A... Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I think as long as we maintain the integrity of our faith and the kingdom of God values first, yeah, recognize that, that as you said earlier, David, that's probably not a pathway to getting elected. Or reelected. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. It is a pathway to participate. Yeah. Yeah. Without ever thinking that the government mm -hmm. is some kind mm -hmm. of ultimate solution to any of these issues. Yeah. And maybe would you guys think that that maybe the answer is, is that our involvement in politics doesn't have to be as an elected official. Uh, our involvement in politics could be as someone who's helping mm -hmm. the elected officials understand and even right. transforming the cultural context because it's the culture that actually makes these politicians, you know, go because they know that they got to get the votes. So, so yeah, um, uh, excellent. All right, hey, here we go. So we're going to go to rapid fire, and 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 here are the rules, David. And I know we have a little bit of a delay issue and, and problems with with the, with the uh, internet, so we'll see if that if if it can work or not. The rules are: we're going to ask you a question, you get one sentence answers yeah, only, right. and no. And, Can and I no just say one, one more comment on that topic? Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Let me just say one th one thing. As a Christian gets involved in politics, um, we need to remember that not only need we to uh, promote Christian, but that's going to mean that there are certain political figures that we just cannot support. We cannot right, support right, them right. because of our Christian values. So, for instance, the archetypical example of this is Nazi Germany. Right. The German Christian Church, by and large, supported Adolf Hitler. But in retrospect, we can clearly see that no well-grounded thinking Christian had any business supporting Adolf Hitler. That was just yeah. wrong. Now, granted, these things may be more difficult to adjudicate in the moment, but this is going to continue to be true for us today. There are certain yeah. kinds of politicians and policies that no Christian has any business supporting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I would fully agree with that. And I think your point actually is we make it hard to see in the present because we convolute it because I want it to be true or I want it to be false. And so I build an ideology to support why it's true. But when you step back 25, 50 years, like there's no ideology that you can use to justify Nazi Germany. Yet many Christians and many pastors did. All right. So here we go, Dave. We're going to try to see if we can get rapid fire right. to work with the uh, internet uh, uh, delay and, and the complications really quickly here. You get, we're going to give you sim some simple questions, maybe not simple. You only get one sentence answers. If you say yes or no, We'll let you add a sentence on, but no pastor sentences where you can, and uh, you know, you, you don't get to keep adding conjunctions and, and making them. It's one sentence, but you do get one lifeline. So if you have one question that you want to, you want to add something else to it, you can go, I want to use my lifeline and you can, you can add a, a clarifying sentence. So we're going to start off with some simple ones to kind of get David uh, uh, going. The first one is what's your favorite book? And you can't say the Bible. Well, you can, but. <laughs> Can I say the Apocrypha? No, that's not it. <laughs> my favorite book. Uh, my favorite religious book is Practicing Christianity by Soren Kierkegaard. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. What's your favorite movie? <coughs> Jeremiah Johnson with Robert Redford. Wow. Oh, I've, I've never seen that. Right, what's your favorite ice cream? Moose tracks. <laughs> well, you live up in Kalispell, Montana. You yeah. have to say that. Uh, what's your favorite pizza? That's it. Supreme with everything on it. 
<laughs> okay, very good. Uh, right, next one. Uh, do uh, should the character of elected officials matter? Here's a little harder question. Should the character of elected officials matter? It should it should certainly be a factor in our considerations. I think. Okay. I think Christians right. have been mistaken in those who think they should only vote for other Christians or only vote for those who adhere strictly to what they view as Christian morality. I certainly think you want to make sure you're voting for somebody who seems to be honest. Okay. Right. Hold on, David, you're breaking the rules. That's more mean. than one sentence. David, you only get one sentence. Oh, answers. I'm giving it. <laughs> uh, and, and, the, and Danny and I are the judges and we, we don't have a buzzer, but, but, uh, I, I'm not going to say that you oh, use I just your lifeline, that but you can't. Sorry. Yeah, that, that's right. Here we go. Next question. Uh, what is the role of the church in advocating for social justice and addressing <laughs> issues of poverty, inequality, and racism? Can you repeat that one, please? Okay. What's the role of the church in advocating for social justice and political issues like poverty, inequality, and, and racism? One sentence. The church should be in the forefront of dealing with all of those issues. Uh, well done. All right, here we go. Uh, how should the church respond to controversial political issues like war, abortion, same-sex marriage, euthanasia? The church needs to be the prophet in the political community speaking to those concerns. All right, good. All right, good. All right. Is it acceptable for Christians to participate in civil disobedience or protest against an unjust government? Absolutely. I've done both and been arrested. <laughs> uh, we'll let that one go. That, that was good. All right. Uh, uh, I didn't know that, but that's a, that's a good answer. In the book, uh, you read the book, you get the story. That's that's right. I think I I thought I I, I thought I did know that. I, I, yep, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. My apologies. All right. how, how can Christians maintain unity? This is kind of Danny's question from earlier. How can Christians maintain unity within the church despite our political differences and political belief and different beliefs? By making sure that Christ and our life in Jesus is always the focus. All right, all right, last question. I'm not sure where you're at in this issue, but let's suppose you're not able to vote for Biden or for Trump for whatever reasons. What should a person do, a Christian do? Well, I believe that if they vote, they should vote for someone who represents their values. Okay. All right, if, very good. All right, hey, perhaps a third excellent. party. <clears throat> All right, excellent. Danny, any, any, any closing thoughts you have? No, I, just, I want to just add my recommendation for people to read the book. I'm just going to, David, when I first started reading the book, um, I was very challenged by it. I wasn't sure what I thought at first. There are parts that made me feel very uncomfortable, and I was happy about that discomfort because it made me think. By the time I got to the end of the book, I thought everyone needs to read this. Uh, excellent. So, and the book is I, I Pledge Allegiance, A Believer's Guide to Kingdom Citizenship. Uh, in 21st century America. Sorry about that, Danny. Go ahead. No, no. I just want to recommend. I think it's worth the read. Even if you come away not agreeing with everything, mm -hmm. it's a very thought-provoking look at the subject that we've been talking about today. I found it very much worth my time to good. have read the book. Very good. Very good. All right. Hey, David, thank you so much. Anything that you want to say as a, as a parting message, you know, or to reaffirm or anything like that um, before we before we finish up? Well, thank you for having me. It's been a great conversation. I appreciate the invitation and um, thank you for recommending the book. And I just would say to everyone, remember that as believe individual or ourselves. All right, excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you so much. We, again, we have a live stream coming up next week with Alex Awad, a Palestinian Christian pastor and just a great human being. I don't want, you don't want to miss that. All that's available on the YouTube channel. You can go to the determinedtruth.com website and see it on the front page there, uh, the, the list of upcoming things. If you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you're automatically notified when the next event's coming up or up, upcoming events. I want to encourage you to, to pay attention to that. Thank you so much, David, for all your time. Thanks, Danny, for your work on this as well. 
And uh, I want to wish everyone a, a, a good day. How's that? All right.